expected. I didn't go to seminary and I wasn't raised a Unitarian. Before this, I was a garbage man, an ocean lifeguard, a college resident director, a bartender, a green contractor, and an urban farmer. But now I'm pretty much a landlord and community organizer. It might not be obvious, but I see the thread that connects them all as being sort of a focus on making communities healthier, by which I mean more inclusive, connected, and just. Today I'm going to tell you the story of The Hub, which is a story about faith and community. It begins with the intertwined histories of American cities and the first UU. We'll come to a crossroads marked by a hundred-year-old house. There's an unexpected eviction, a life-or-death decision, a leap of faith, and a renaissance. First UU was established in Orange, New Jersey 125 years ago and is a true urban church. It's located on Cleveland Street, which is also known as Ben Jones Place, named after the city's first black elected official. It's just steps from Main Street's business district, the Morris and Essex Line's Orange train station, countless New Jersey transit bus stops, a handful of public schools, the public library, and City Hall. First UU is an anchor institution, which is a public, private, or nonprofit organization whose everyday activities strengthen the urban and social fabric of the community that it's in. First UU has been in the same location the entire time, and the church has provided a space for like minded people to meet and worship for generations. But like many American cities, Orange's history is an industrial one. It was once the hat-making capital of the United States, as well as a major hub of beer production. But as a result of globalization and America's urban policies, which include urban renewal, deindustrialization, highway construction, and the suburbanization of the middle class, today it's one of the count country's countless Rust Belt cities dealing with the problems of many urban places, an overburdened public school system and a less educated adult population, high levels of unemployment with an excess of low wage, low paying jobs, an aging housing stock, chronic rent burden, and the growing threat of displacement from transit oriented development and gentrification. While some of Orange's other anchors could not weather the storm of disinvestment, the first UU survived these policies, but as a direct result of them, by the beginning of the 2000s, it found itself with a steadily dwindling membership. Faced with difficult decisions by the summer of 2015, the congregation had identified two options for its future. On the one hand, dissolve the church and use the remaining resources to support UU activities, or to turn its faith outward and become a more relevant model of urban ministry. And that's where my relationship with First UU and The Hub begins. I had never heard of Unitarian Universalists until two and a half years ago when Dr. Mindy Fullylove, the current board president of First UU, who also happened to be my graduate thesis advisor at the new school, told me about her church in New Jersey. They were considering developing a new urban ministry called The Hub, H-U-U-B, and might soon be looking for a managing director. <coughs> Working closely with Mindy for almost a year during graduate school, I had heard a ton about her hometown, Orange, New Jersey. And especially after living and working in Brooklyn for almost seven years, it sounded a lot like the place where I'm from. I grew up in central, rural central New York, outside of Utica, which is a small post-industrial Rust Belt city not unlike Orange. Utica's heyday as a textile manufacturing hub stemmed from its location on the Erie Canal and the New York Central Railroad, halfway between the resource-rich Midwest and New York City's global markets. And ever since I was in college, I've been interested in the potential for small cities like Utica and Orange to overcome these policies of disinvestment that have shaped them since the Great Depression. I think cities are the modern laboratories of not only democracy, but also sustainable, inclusive, and diverse communities. More people living closer together with access to mass transit, cycling, and walking, fueled by locally owned businesses, creating opportunities for folks to make a living while investing and rooting wealth in their communities. So I was excited about the idea of working in a smaller city on issues I was passionate about, and the hub sounded cool but I had never really considered working in a church. 
I was raised Catholic and church had been a constant in my life growing up. We went to mass on most Sundays. I went to religion class through my teens. I'm both baptized and confirmed. But despite all this, I've never totally embraced the dogma and actually disagree with some of the institution's socially conservative views, like limited gender and reproductive rights. But, and so from my view, churches didn't seem like the best places to be doing the things that I believed in. The things that I had built my practice around. But if Mindy thought I'd be a good fit at her UU church, I had to at least check it out. When Mindy invited me to the first UU's 2015 annual meeting, I was excited to visit the church, to meet members of the congregation, and hopefully leave an impression when they started looking for a director, if they started looking for a director. It was Sunday, June 14th, 2015, when my wife Camille and I drove out to Orange from Brooklyn. It wasn't my first time to Orange, but it was the first time I visited the UU and the first time I saw the campus in person. From the street and sidewalk, it's a beautiful small campus. The grassy front lawn is flanked by the sanctuary on the left and the parish hall on the right. Both buildings are clad in dark cedar shingles and accented by white trim with leaded decorative stained glass windows. The trees and shrubbery handsomely balance out the buildings. The sanctuary is an intimate space, a lot like this one, immediately spiritual and calming, and the smell of one of our tenants' frankincense always hangs in the air. The dark warmth of the pews and the wainscoting, the massive trusses, really contrast with the plastered walls and ceiling, which glow from light coming in through the windows and clear stories. At the front of the sanctuary is a grand organ framed by a Gothic arch. It's classic, humble, and sacred. But in the parish hall is the real jewel of the church, a 10 foot by 15 foot Tiffany window in the room's eastern wall, where it might very well catch more sun than the Jersey Shore on a clear summer day. The geometric design is of a double arch that leads into a marbled green field. The window's inscription, blessed are the peacemakers, welcomes visitors into the space and into the community. It invites them to do this work, to live this faith and to be a peacemaker. On blue sky days, the light in the parish hall is magical as the sun's rays come through. It's a stirring thing to see and I still stop sometimes to appreciate its beauty when I'm passing through and the timing is right. And it was a beautiful, and it was beautiful on that Sunday in June 2015. Sunny without a cloud in the sky and it must have been 90 degrees in the parish hall, which didn't have fans or air conditioning at the time. And the reason I remember so well is because Camille was nine months pregnant. That little guy right there was born three days later, on June 17th. We arrived before Mindy and introduced ourselves as friends of hers, and helped prep for the meeting, moving chairs and a few tables, setting up for coffee hour and generally chatting with people. We'd been there for about half an hour and they were ready to get the meeting started when a few, few folks approached us and somewhat sheepishly asked us what we were actually doing there. They were confused why, why Mindy would invite us people they didn't know, and non-members, to this annual meeting, which was for members of the congregation only. They said that it was really nice to meet us, but that we had to leave, sugarcoating it a bit by ensuring us that Camille didn't want to be sitting in the parish hall's hot, stale air for two hours listening to UUs talk about whatever it is UUs talk about. Getting over the shock of being asked to leave the church, Camille and I adjusted our plans and decided to check out Orange, grab some food, go for a walk. Luckily, we were hanging out with Molly Kaufman and Javi Smith, Mindy's daughter and grandson, who gave us some great ideas for the day as we gave them a ride home. Molly suggested Hat City Kitchen for a bite to eat and South Mountain Reservation for a walk or hike. Camille had been in early labor for two weeks and was not really enjoying that experience. So we'd been going on long, mile-long hikes around Brooklyn, trying to get baby to commit, really start making moves. <laughs> Our suddenly open afternoon seemed like a good opportunity to get a good walk in. Hat City sounded cool, and the first person we met there, our server at the time, was Patricia Rogers, a young journalist who was active in Orange's art community. Patricia was super nice and welcomed us to Orange like old friends, telling us some stories, giving us pointers about South Mountain adventuring, and hooking us up with great food, generally helping to redeem the morning for us. So despite our experience with the congregation, we were finding that the city was a welcoming place, that people were proud of this little city and its diversity of people and neighborhoods. 
Patricia was a great ambassador for the city, an introduction to the community that the church had lost touch with, and an amazing example of the gifts and assets that the city had. But what I didn't understand at the time was the level of stress, anxiety, and probably even embarrassment that the congregation was feeling at that moment. Over the next few hours, while Camille and I were feasting at Hat City and stomping around South Mountain, the members of First UU were deciding on the future of their church, an institution they loved, they were the caretakers of, and whose legacy they were responsible for. They were at a low point. The church was pretty much on its deathbed. The congregation had atrophied. The part-time minister had left because of the sad Sunday turnouts, and they felt like slumlords, renting space to small churches and organizations without committing the proper resources to take care of the buildings. While I saw the beauty of the church when I first walked up, the reality was that the regular maintenance, upkeep, and improvements for this 125-year-old house had been put on the back burner, sidelined while the congregation and its ministers tried to make do with what little budget they had for buildings and grounds. This deferred maintenance was catching up to them. There were significant safety and structural hazards developing, and the congregation knew it. The main entrance had a few stairs up to a small porch with a long wooden ramp leading down to a sidewalk. The entire ensemble was falling apart and was actually more dangerous than welcoming. I was definitely worried when Camille started climbing up in that day. And the building's envelope was leaking as well. Patches of roof shingles were damaged and significant sections of the cedar siding were cracked, broken, or completely missing. Water was getting in and throughout the church, stains were growing, cracks were forming, and paint was peeling. Despite what I saw, the church was an albatross, more headache than resource, an asset that had been an enormous source of stress for the church trustees and members. And so on that hot June afternoon, the congregation had to decide what to do next. They had arrived at a crossroads, and both their options were difficult to swallow. Should they close their doors and sell their buildings? shuttering one of Orange's few remaining anchor institutions and closing the book on First UU's 125-year history in the community? Or could they pivot completely and follow the advice of Om Prakash, Reverend John Gilmore, and stop thinking about the church in the traditional sense, stop trying to fill the pews on Sundays, and come to terms with the fact that the church they knew was dead? They had to commit to, to have faith in, the idea of opening their doors and welcoming folks into their buildings, offering the parish hall and sanctuary as resources to their neighbors, and filling the spaces with people, whether they were UUs or not, while working to bring the UU principles into the community through the people and activities that would follow. My experience that day was a microcosm of the church's dilemma. Camille and I arrived at a church meeting as people who you'd think the congregation would be excited about. A younger couple starting a family with energy and a desire to get involved, to help out. But the doors were already closed. The congregation wasn't ready to invite us in. Maybe because they just didn't want us. Or maybe they couldn't see the church's potential for a rebound. Or maybe they just didn't want to invite us in because they were about to bury this thing they knew as church. And then just a few minutes later at Hat City, we were welcomed to Orange with open arms. I saw and felt the bounty of social and human wealth that the city has. Despite what the demographics say, Orange is a rich city full of history and assets and people like Patricia Rogers, young people who could benefit from a public space to share their work, for Patricia and her peers to organize and build their voice as the next generation of engaged citizens making the city a better place for themselves. And I'm here today because the members of the first UU took a leap of faith. They committed to the hub for an initial planning year and believed that by opening their doors and inviting their neighbors in, by getting to know and building community with the people of Orange, by creating inclusive programming to advance social justice and democratic values, they could again find worth and meaning in the resources they had to offer. They had faith in the potential of the UU principles to shape an urban ministry, a hub of social justice in a city going through pretty tough times. And that's how almost two years ago the hub was launched, and I was hired as its, as its founding managing director. My job during the planning year was to get to know folks from Orange, see whether there was a need for what we had to offer, and to develop a plan to fix up the building so they wouldn't fall or burn down. And the real question was, what do we do next? 
So the thing is, I didn't really know what Unitarian Universalism was. Even though, as I started getting into earlier, I have a complicated relationship with Catholicism, I definitely have a spiritual side and faith-based beliefs. I believe that we're all part of a higher connection or system or something, but I instinctively question the idea of an all-knowing God sort of planning it all and putting it all together or whatever. I'm super interested in the ideas and the teachings that come from different religions, but I'm skeptical of being told how to interpret them and refuse to accept when they're used to justify violence against people who believe different things. I had never considered that there was a faith community where this openness and commitment to learning was the dogma. So, imagine my excitement when after cruising the UUA website for a while, I learned that UUUs are exactly that. Groups of people all over the world whose faith journeys are shaped by individuals in the congregation, many of whom come to Unitarian Universalism from other faiths. A faith whose guiding principles are basically the unspoken values I live my life by, but had never seen written on paper before. Here are groups of people who regularly come together to discuss a liberal idea of spirituality, who have also put their faith into action from the front lines of this country's many civil rights struggles. To me, the Unitarian principles boil down to how to be a good, a fundamental ingredient to any healthy and strong community, a good neighbor. Everyone should know them because they're powerful and straightforward and open and inclusive and, despite how I sound, non-evangelical. I guess you could say I drank the UU Kool-Aid, the K-U-U-L-Aid. <laughs> yeah? yeah, you guys. I started to see that to live the UU principles at the hub, we needed to both open our doors and our hearts and to invite everyone, strangers, into our home, our buildings. But it had to be without reservation, without judgment, without bias. We needed to be totally inclusive and actively build community with the people we hadn't been. We needed to get to know the people living next door to us on Cleveland Street, the families with children at Rosa Parks Community School right next door, and the teachers who use our parking lot every day. We needed to tell Patricia that she could use our buildings for whatever she wanted, whenever she wanted to. And so that's what we did. And it worked. And it's still working. So many things have been happening at the church since the hub started, but I'd like to share three that really reflect how I see us living the UU principles. At the end of April 2016, a friend contacted us on behalf of a family whose young 23-year-old son had been murdered. Part of a wave of gun violence in Orange last year, the family was in desperate need of a place to hold the funeral repast. The request came in on a Friday afternoon, and we were able to provide space and support for the family by Saturday. There were about 100 people in the church that are on the church lawn that day and 50 more inside enjoying the feast that had been spread. It was so incredibly sad, but it was also an honor to be part of the community in that way. Seeing the young man's photo in the parish hall that has been for over 100 years such a central part of our religious life was a very moving experience and we were so proud that the hub exists and could fill that void. I think it's a powerful example of the third principle, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth, and the seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence for which we're a part. And the second event occurred the Sunday after Donald Trump's election. Our lay-led service was planned for that morning. People who had been using our space for a wide variety of activities joined with us to create a hot luck potluck that welcomed 35 people. People that needed a place to go and who chose our church as a place of comfort. We shared delicious food as well as our shock and commitment to resistance. This was the beginning of many pro-democracy activities and collaborations, including the Hub's leadership in an effort to make Orange a sanctuary city. The potluck and work that has grown from it embody two more of the principles. The fourth, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And the fifth, the right of consciousness in the democratic process. The third is our community listening project, which has been led by the Hub Fellows. In August 2016, we selected three young adults from the community to be Hub Fellows. They were chosen because of their diverse skill set, interest in community empowerment, and existing relationships in the city. Patricia Rogers, my ambassador to Orange, is now a second year senior Hub Fellow, which is very exciting. 
Using the principles learned in ABCD, that is an asset-based community development workshop, the Hub Fellows started three community listening projects, a Spring Solidarity Potluck Series, Immigrant Dreams, and Amplifying Youth Voices. These diverse projects reach out to many different groups of Orange's population, from youth to elders, long-time city residents to newly arrived ones, educators to faith leaders and everywhere in between. ABCD is about focusing on the assets that already exist in a place. Whether it's a UU church or an underinvested and marginalized community, instead of pointing out what is missing or needs to be brought in to fix the place. The motto could be, everything we need is already here. ABCD completely embodies the first UU principle. The inherent worth and dignity of every person. All the events that have grown out of the Community Listening Project have been about creating opportunities to spend time with people, to build relationships, which I see as living the second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Every day it seems like there are more efforts to try and divide us. The beautiful complexity of our society and others is being boiled down to create scapegoats. Our problems being the fault of how people are different than me, where they are from, what religion they practice, what race they are, or how they exercise their right to free speech, just to name a few. This divisiveness is how people in power try to stay in power, turning unfamiliarity into fear and using them to undermine the strength of America's greatest assets. I think it's our diversity and our optimism. Unitarian Universalism is founded on the principles that help make sure these assets strengthen our society, being open-minded, welcoming, and tirelessly firing, fighting for peace, liberty, and justice. From the redlining, blockbusting, and planned shrinkage of the 20th century to the gentrification and displacement, predatory lending, and institutionalized racism of the 21st century, policies and economic forces have been trying to divide and sort us for decades. The Unitarian Universalist history is full of examples of standing on the side of inclusiveness and blind love, of being at the forefront of social justice and civil rights. This history and the principles and values that have guided it are major assets, and the ideas supported by the practice of hospitality are very powerful ones. Creating the hub was a difficult decision for the first UU congregation to make because it meant accepting that the traditional institution wasn't succeeding, that in fact it was dying, if not already dead. But having the hub succeed has been relatively simple. By living the principles, not just thinking and talking about them, we are a good neighbor in a community ravaged by trauma. As part of the first UU now, I'm incredibly proud to say we when I talk about the work we've done and continue to do. We're launching a capital campaign and already investing our buildings. Now there's an amazing new entrance with a beautiful sidewalk that we replant each spring for our flower ceremony. And we're replacing the sanctuary roof this fall. Check out the church's website and our Facebook pages to hear about the really cool things we're doing. Our doors are open. We're getting to know people and we welcome everyone into the church to use however they want. We're proud to say that by providing this, we're actively helping to heal and strengthen the community we've been in for 125 years. Really appreciate you guys having me today, and I hope to see everyone at the Hub sometime. Thank you.